Thank you, Pastor Susan. So here we are in Lent, and uh, part of our, our Lenten series is around the theme, um, Becoming Nothing. And uh, really, I think the more that we begin to understand uh, our poverty before our faithful Father, uh, we want to move more into that place. I remember in a, in a Bible study, a men's Bible study I was leading, uh, Jerry Bridges' Pursuit of Holiness one of the things we learned is that the more I know of my sin, the more I need to know of his faithfulness, amen? And the more I know of his faithfulness, the more I know of my sin, and they go hand in hand. So be becoming nothing is part of living into um, the wholeness, holiness, and faithfulness of our everlasting Abba Father. And so this has been a wonderful Lenten season this year. Um, absolutely horrible <laughs> when I look in the mirror and I see who I really am, and absolutely wonderful because every time I look in the mirror... I look more like my Savior. That's what I want. That's what I want for you too, to be made more in the likeness of Christ. That's our theme for this morning. In fact, uh, Luke 22, beginning at verse 24, I think the address will be on the screen, Luke 22, 24, and um, that's where I want you to be. So if you have a paper Bible, open it there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book, New Testament. If you're following online or you have a digital device, uh, just open your scripture, and there will be a couple of places where you might want to underline or take notes um, or even highlight and circle. Um, we're going to enter a story that in the middle of which there's going to be a collision. And I'll let you know right before it happens. Um, a collision of the faithfulness and character of Christ that bumps up against his disciples. And you would think that during the Passover, when Jesus is reclining with his disciples, that they would have it all figured out, and they would be ready to plant the kingdom of heaven on earth, and man, they weren't ready. And so Jesus calls them out, you see, because he reveals to them who he is, the great I am, and he calls them into his likeness. In fact, I think these words are on the screen, I am. Show us that screen, I am. How would you finish that sentence? I am. If you're a note taker, maybe write that in the margin somewhere where you can fill it out later because uh, we're going to come back to that at the very end of today's message in about 58, 67 minutes, somewhere around there. Um, nothing, huh? All right. 38 minutes, is that better? Yeah, I'll let you know when we're about done, okay? Uh, um, we're going to come back. We're going to circle to this statement a couple of times. I am. How would, just shout it out real quick. I am. How would you finish this statement right now? I am what? Child of God. Thank you. Amen. What else? I am forgiven. I am chosen. I am hungry. <laughs> you probably had to drive the furthest this morning. You just get breakfast before you go, man, says the young man. <laughs> I'm hungry. What else? I am loved. Thankful, blessed, a mom, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sometimes we identify ourselves by our circumstances, sometimes by our character, sometimes by the one who owns us, the one who knows us and loves us. I am a child of God. I am held together. I am on the way to my eternal mansion and glory. You know, if you've been following along with Alive on uh, Facebook or through the Pulse or through those other places, um, you know that this week has been a difficult week for Alive. Matt Carroll's sitting here, a brand new widow. And we love you, and I'm glad that you're with your people, sitting with your family. We know other people who are a part of our journey that have had the same experience this week. And yet you can say, I'm okay, I'm held together. I'm going to be all right. I'm hurting. I'm falling apart. Like dropping some fine china on the kitchen floor. It just shatters. It goes under the appliances and it takes a while to clean up. I am. I am a child of God. So think about it. Keep that open until the end. Maybe whatever you're thinking right now about who you are might be a little different in just a few minutes. We're going to enter the text at Luke 22, 24, like I said, in a collision moment where Jesus has his closest followers with him, and yet there's this moment. Here's the context. They're celebrating the Passover right before the death of Jesus Christ, and the scripture says they are reclined together around the table, whatever that looks like, if they're laying uh, with their feet to the outside, uh, on their stomachs, towards the inside. I'm not sure. Are they laying on their sides? You know, I'm not, I don't know exactly what that was like for them in the upper room. 
all the pictures that I've seen, and you know they're not Polaroids, they're around a table, right? And usually on one side so we can see their faces. We don't know exactly what that was like, but we do know this from the scripture. While they were reclined at the table, Jesus passes the cup of the Passover, and he breaks the bread, and he gives thanks, and in his very own words, he says that he's ushering in a new covenant in his blood. He redefines the whole experience and lets them know who truly is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's a brand new era. It's called the New Testament because it's brand new. In the middle of that, Jesus says, but woe to anyone who betrays me. And he is at the table with me. His hand is with mine. And immediately the disciples begin to question each other. The scripture says, they say, well, who, who, would us, who of us would do this? And they begin to look around, which one of us is it? And you can imagine how that goes. You know, uh, it's not me. I know my own heart. I know my own motivation. It, motivation. it can't be me. It must be. No, it can't be you. I know I've worked with you for three years now. There's no way it would be. Maybe it's, and you can imagine the introspection of could I ever do that? And then the judgment. The most amazing part of that story, if you read it like a story, is that as Jesus is reclining at the table, celebrating the Passover with his disciples, teaches them about who he is and the ushering in of the new covenant, and then comes that super serious moment where he says, one of you is going to betray me. Luke, the writer, Dr. Luke, records for us that right on the heels of that moment, the disciples begin to have an argument. They begin to immediately ask themselves who is the greatest among them. Those two things don't go together. Which one of us is going to betray our Lord? Which one of us is the greatest? It's oil and water. So you can imagine immediately on the, on the heels of Jesus saying, someone here will betray me, they play this spiritual game of dodgeball, right? It's like, it's not me. I wouldn't do that. It's got to be you. And immediately pride grows in. There's an argument. Everyone clamoring for the best seat, wondering who of us is then the greatest. It's a crazy thing, the human heart, that when it's revealed to us that there's sin in there, we can just as quickly step into, well, it can't be me. I'm probably one of the best. It's a crazy turn of events. Jesus reveals that in establishing the new covenant, he will die at the hand of one of them. And immediately in the, well, for sure it's not me moment, that weed of, of pride puffs up and it grows flowers and it spreads its poisonous scent around the room. And here's maybe how that sounded. If it's not me and I know it's not me, then maybe I'm the greatest disciple. Can't be me. Have you ever been at that table? where everyone is wondering who is the least and everyone knows who's the best. You've probably been at a table like that, in a conversation like that. Jesus was. You see, he was at the table that day with a crazy bunch of sinners. They were doubters and deniers and betrayers and braggarts, and even though Jesus was the greatest one of them all, he chose the least position. He chose self-denial unto death, to hang on the cross in our place, to become nothing so that we could inherit everything. That's what's going on as they recline around the table. So let's start there, and before we do, I'm going to ask a blessing, and it's from Philippians 2, verse 6. Pray with me. Jesus, you denied yourself and released the advantages of being divine God. You made yourself nothing, instead taking on the weakness of humanity. And you didn't choose royal humanity either. You chose servanthood, humility, the one who would die first. Today, bless us with your word and your Holy Spirit and your presence. Resurrect us today from the shackles of our sin, our prisons of pride, and our pursuit of popularity, even our addiction to achievement. May your word go out today to accomplish the purpose that you have established, that it might take root in our hearts to grow the fruit of righteousness, that you might be blessed and pleased to dwell in us. Help us to be church today. Help me to be a good teacher, all of us to be good disciples. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's pick it up at verse 24. Have your scripture open, and here's that word, a dispute 
arose among them. Um, it's a simple word. We know dispute. It means strife or contention. Um, but it's also an emotional word. This word is used when people love the dispute. Kind of like being in an argument once in a while. Maybe I'm a little like them. Maybe you are. I mean, we can hate conflict. I don't enjoy conflict. But somehow we can easily get caught up in those disputes. And somehow there's some strange satisfaction that comes out of that. And our, our, our blood pressure goes up a little bit. And our anger flares. And uh, we get political and religious and, and moral. And there's contention. And somehow, like the disciples, we put our thumbs behind our suspenders. And we feel bigger and better. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm the only one. Maybe this message is just for me alone. Maybe. But listen. Listen. I think we're just like the disciples at the table with Jesus and the constant disputes to be right, to be smarter, to be less afraid, to be more faithful. These are exhausting. The scripture says, a dispute arose among them as to which one of them was considered to be the greatest. It means large and wide is what it means. Uh, you can imagine how that looks. Hey, I was the first disciple. You guys, get in line. I cast out more demons. I preached more in your name. I've given up more. I gave up my business and my family's out. You can imagine. How, what were they saying? They weren't just saying, no, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. I bet it was more than that. I bet they whipped out their Sunday school pins. I've never missed a Bible study in my life. I know six languages. I don't know what they were saying. But they started to share their stories, started to compare, compare their wounds and their battle scars. It's almost like when you welcome a guest into your home, the home of your heart, and the first room that you take them into is your trophy room. <laughs> In my context, I'm a preacher. I sit with ministers from other denominations, other congregations, other counties. And once in a while, this weed comes up. Who's the better preacher, teacher? Whose church is bigger? Whose church is growing? Whose church is the most cool? I have to be quiet in those moments because you can't say alive all the time. <laughs> Let me be serious, though. The disciples were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Who's done more, given up more, is better? Who has the most verses memorized? Who has the biggest donor card in the group? That's what this is all about. It's easy to get puffed up and, and peacock our feathers and strut our stuff and have our resumes ready to go and show them. And when we raise our hands to be seen, hey, look at me, instead of raising our hands in hallelujahs, all right, we get it. That's what was going on at the Passover table with Jesus. They were full of themselves. This is that resonating percussion in the upper room. It's a collision of motivations. It's the heart of the follower of Jesus who would be a disciple and the actual heart of Jesus Christ himself. While they were arguing about who was the greatest, they were tearing themselves away from Jesus. You see, Jesus was in the middle of becoming nothing. He was sharing the deepest truth of the Passover with them, that he was going to die to usher in a brand new covenant of forgiveness in his blood, and they're in the corner arguing about who has the most Sunday school pins. He knew that to do his Father's will, he must empty himself. He must pour out his life, his lifeblood actually spilt on the ground and soaked into the earth that he created. That's what we talked about last week, to pour out your life. And while Jesus was revealing that truth about himself, the followers of Jesus in that moment were clamoring for a benefit while he was letting go of his. A collision of motivations, and I wonder if Jesus' heart ached as he watched them. As he listened to them, did their pride pierce his heart? I don't know. I wonder, did, did he roll his eyes at them? It's like, come on. Did he sigh a little bit? 
You know, the scripture says that in a moment, he, he teaches them in that moment. When they're all in this heated argument, he takes that as an opportunity to, to teach them. But I wonder if he just sat in silence and let them burn out and quiet down a little bit. Because silence is powerful. You know what I mean? Uh, I learned this trick a long time ago as a youth pastor. Uh, at a church down the road, I had about 185 junior high kids in my youth group. You can imagine, right? And we filled this gymnasium, and there was no way I could talk louder than them. So I would just stand in the front, and I would say, if you can hear me, do this. And a couple of them would do it. I'd say, if you can hear me, do this. And pretty soon, the whole group of them are not saying anything, but they're doing this. It was the dumbest trick in the world, but silence works. I wonder if Jesus just sat there quiet, and in the power of silence, he said this, verse 25, it's on the screen. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. Remember we talked about this a few weeks ago? The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. That word lord it over means that they're exercising their rights over yours. That they're putting themselves in an elevated position. The Gentile lord, uh, I'm sorry, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. That word beni, bena, it's, it's good. Uh, our language would be, they call themselves do-gooders. They put, things in a pos- they put themselves in a position to be over you, um, and then they call themselves do-gooders. Right now, some of us are thinking about government officials who make rules for our benefit. That's our context right now. Do you know it was their context too? They were occupied by a foreign government. Listen, Jesus wasn't talking about the government. He was talking about his disciples' heart. They were selfish and proud, arguing about who was the greatest, and he calls them out. He calls out his followers because we can be just like that. He was teaching them about the depth of their own depravity. They hated the imposition of others, but in truth, their hearts in sinful nature are exactly the same. That unless we die to ourselves and become alive in Christ by the Holy Spirit, we're the same. I have the word wait right here in my notes. I'd like to say something that might sting a little bit. It might sting a little bit because it might be true. Say yes if I have your permission to say it anyway. I think the church today is a little bit like the disciples around the table. And we're arguing about who's the greatest and we kind of enjoy it a little bit. And I don't often speak prophetically, but I think this is true. A priest speaks to God for the sake of the people. A prophet speaks for God to his people. Does that make sense? I think this is a prophetic word. The church is arguing with itself while we're in fellowship with Jesus in the season of Lent. We're arguing about who's the best. (laughs) We must be better. We're growing. I've actually had other ministers to my house to tell me what to do so that our church would grow because theirs is. It's about, we're arguing about who's the greatest. We'll never close, we'll never stay home. We're arguing about who's the smartest or who has the most faith. I've heard it a thousand times. God, I can do what I want because God won't let me die one moment before it's my time. We don't apply that rule anywhere else in life. We take medicine, we go to the doctor, we don't run across the freeway, we don't burn the red lights. This is the temptation of Matthew 4 when the devil took Jesus, our Lord, to the pinnacle of the temple and said, just do it, just jump down. He'll send you angels. And you know what Jesus said? Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. So if I'm wrong, We have a dozen elders, half a dozen elders. They'll take care of me tomorrow, but I think it's a prophetic word. Who's the best? Who's the greatest? Who's the smartest? Who has the most faith? I don't know what the disciples with Jesus were arguing about. Were they arguing about government, about Caesar? In those days, Caesar was God. I mean, they made him divine. I would never do what Caesar says. He's just some foreign government official. 
He's a doofus. Why would I? Is that were they arguing about? If any of them were sheeple? Yesterday I invited someone to join us for church today. You want to know their first question? Yes. Do you wear a mask at your church? So we do. We all do. Well, then I ain't coming. You're nothing but a puppet. Bunch of sheeple. For reals. It's quiet in here, huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's Lent. Maybe they're arguing about the cross. I mean, they would kill people on the cross. Jesus wasn't the only one. Do you know that Jesus surrendered his life to a foreign government to be hung by their officials on their cross? He let it happen. And when Peter tried to stop him, what did he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. I was saving this for my last Sunday at Alive. <laughs> I hope it's not. It might be. <laughs> I actually asked some people for permission to say that because I don't know if I should. Because I hate conflict, but I'm not afraid of it. I don't know what the disciples were arguing about. I don't know if it was Caesar or crosses or which one what did the most or are, if they're a sheeple or a puppet. I don't know. But remember, they still didn't get it yet. Even when Jesus was talking to them after the resurrection, they still didn't understand they still, when they were reclining at this table, were thinking about a political kingdom and Jesus would be their king. So I bet they were talking about Romans and crosses and what to do, strategies. I bet they were. It doesn't matter. We don't know. I don't know. But what we do know is that they were picking sides. They were sliding away from each other on the benches at the banquet. And instead of fighting the gates of hell together, hand in hand building the kingdom of heaven, instead of being on their knees together in prayer, disciples were fighting each other <laughs> with biting words of comparison. What is it? Uh, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. Float like a butterfly. Sting like a bee. That's what it was like. But Jesus, in all of his holy patience speaks again. And like drawing a line down the middle of that table in the center of the room, he calls them to not be on either side, but to be on one side together. And this is what he says in verse 26. But you're not like that. Don't be like that. It's not who you are. It's not what leadership and authority look like to lord it over and take advantage for themselves. It's not that. Here's the absolute truth about who you are. This will define your manner and your purpose and the life fitting for a follower of Jesus. Instead, here's the comparison. Here's the alternate reality. Instead, the greatest among you, the same words the disciples were using when they argued about who was the greatest. Who's the best disciple of all time? The greatest among you should be like the youngest. Now listen. The youngest means something that was not before. It's the same as being born again. It's what the Apostle Paul taught when he said you put new wine in new wineskins or you put new wine in an old wineskin and the old wineskin will burst and both will be lost. He said it's all brand new, no history, no past. The things from before are done. Remember, he's the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment of the promises. He's everything that we need. And he says the greatest among you is like the youngest. <laughs> brand new, new creation, the apostle said. And the one who rules the one who leads by going before, the one who shows the way. That's the mark of the disciple. How you see yourself and your purpose is like the one who serves, the one who hurries up to get into the dirt, to serve at the table, to choose to give their life for someone else who chooses to become nothing and give up their personal benefit. Verse 27, for who's greater, the one at the table or the one who serves? Everybody knows it's the one who's at the table. That's the natural social order. It's what we aspire to too often to take the best seed and have the food brought to us. And then Jesus drops the hammer. He says, but, in verse 27, that's the contrast. I am among you as one who serves. I am. Ego eimi is the Greek text. I am, the great I am. Jesus, in revealing his purpose and his plan, also reveals his divinity again. 
He says, I am the great I am, and you're becoming like me. I am. I'm among you as one who serves. The totality of Jesus' existence. Listen, I want you to know Jesus is to be our redeemer. He's the bread of life, the light of life. He's eternal God. He's incarnate God here in the flesh to serve us with his life. That's who he is. He's the way, the only way by which we may be saved. He's the truth. He's the truth about us. He's the truth about our heavenly father. And he is our life. Our life today and our eternal life. Everything is in him. And I think this is the conflict, the collision, the disciples engaged in at the disciple. Their character up against the character of Christ. And the question is, who am I? Who am I going to be like? And there are only two options that Jesus presents in the upper room that day. You could be like the world and grab at greatness and power and success and love it when you're better than others. Or you can be like Jesus. Those are the only two options he gave. Has anybody seen Despicable Me 1, the first version? I wonder if the writer of that knew this. Listen, in the plot uh, in Despicable Me, Vector, Dr. Nefario, and Gru. It's fun to talk about cartoons in church. Come on. You know what their plot was? To steal the moon, right? And to destroy anything and everyone who would stand in their way. With millions of weapons. You've got to love their weapons. Um, they blow up half the world and they're still all there. I don't know. With millions of weapons and as many minions, Gru launches his plot. But soon we discover that love and servanthood overwhelm his pride and his arrogance and three little orphan girls steal his heart. He's over the moon for Margot and Edith and little Agnes. And he chooses to be a servant. That was too simplistic. But 100% of you are listening right now. <laughs> In one option, we have the way of the world to grab as much as you can, as often as you can, the other option that Jesus presents is to be who you are created to be. By being born again and transformed in the way we think and behave, disciples become deacons, servants who become nothing, who serve anyone, anywhere. And so Jesus holds out those two examples, the Gentile lords who stuff their pockets in their faces and himself, himself. Eternal God here among us with flesh on, Emmanuel, God with us as one who serves us. The great I am in teaching us who he really is is also defining who we really are. The little I ams. The reflection of his glory and his person. Paul helps me under, understand what Jesus means. Paul understood that Jesus, even though he was eternal God, became nothing. Even though he was eternal God, he took up our likeness. Isn't that backwards? He took up our likeness, our weakness, our nature. And he did it so we could be saved, so we could live forever with him. And, and for this life here, so here we can live like him. Jesus said, I'm among you as one who serves. Be like me. Not the crazy world. It's exactly what Paul taught in Philippians 2, verse 5. It's on the screen. In your relationships, one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Let that sink in for a second. He made himself nothing. He made himself in our likeness. It's crazy backwards, right? But maybe it's not backwards. Maybe it's forward into his plan of salvation, into life, where he changes mourning into dancing, and he changes shame into glory, and then it's glory to glory unto eternal life. I mean, come on. Um, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Verse 7 says, he, made, he was made in our likeness in order to become nothing. There is no other God that humans believe in, no other God that is eternal creator made incarnate as a servant who died in our place and was risen from the dead. There is no God like our God, amen? The maker of heaven and earth, the redeemer 
and Savior and friend of sinners, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, is now the Lion of Judah who lives and reigns forever. He was made in our likeness. John 1.14, the eternal Son, the Word of God in the flesh who made his dwelling among us here, taking up all of our infirmities, suffering in our weakness and in our temptation, knowing poverty and reproach and hatred. He came here to reconcile his creation to himself, taking us from the poverty of our sin. He redeems and restores and resurrects us unto eternal life. And he did it all by taking up our nature. One person, two natures, truly God, fully divine, and truly man, exactly like us except for sin. It wasn't just some superhero costume. He came here and actually took on our flesh. He chose to become nothing in order to take our place in death. He chose to become nothing to suffer our shame and bear our guilt and die that cursed death to offer himself to death in the darkness of the middle of the day. And in rising for our resurrection, we know him and we know who we should become because we're being made like him. Here's the last point. I wrote four more minutes. I bet I can do it. How are we doing? Oh, we had a lot of time. It'll be worth it, I promise. The reason that it feels backwards and seems backwards is because you know the scriptures. We were made in his likeness. Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Why? So they can rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the air and the livestock and the wild animals, over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So now we reflect his dominion and we rule over his creation. We're blessed with speech that we might have communion with God and lead others in discipleship. We can think and reason and express our will and even live morally. And all of that is the fruit. It's secondary to the truth that we are made like God to pursue him in holiness. But when we sinned, all of that grew dim and dark because we died inside. That glory got poured out. Our holiness was covered as in a grave. And that's why Jesus came here. To command us to live, to call our name just like he did to Lazarus. When he, Lazarus, when he called him out of the tomb, he, re, he resurrects us from death to sin and makes us alive in him. We are forgiven and set free, called out of the grave of darkness and into his light. We're being made clean, being made new into the likeness of Christ, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorifies. God does all this so we will be made like his son, Jesus. The first Adam, he blew it. Death. The second Adam redeemed and restored us in resurrection, and now he calls us to be like him. The world is not who we are. We're children of the Most High God, born again, being made like Christ, glory to glory, being filled back up with righteousness and obedience to Christ. What Jesus taught in the upper room that day is not about glory now. It's not about position and power and prestige. It's about being a servant like him, becoming nothing. This Lent, when you finish the sentence, I am, how will you finish it? Jesus finished that teaching in the upper room by saying this. You are those who stood by me in my trials. He affirmed them. And now I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred on me. He gave them a commission. Why? So that you can eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But that glory comes through service. Maybe my sentence I am, will be I'm a child of the king, or I'm looking a little more like my older brother Jesus. (laughs) I'm a servant of all. I'm becoming nothing. 
I'm beginning to know that one day I will see Jesus face to face. Today my heart is burning with Holy Spirit fire. Because one day I will see him. And every day I want to serve him. We are children of God. May the Lord help us to live like one. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are faithful and good. You are everything that we desire. You are our Father and our friend. You are with us even in the fire. You never fail. You have blessed your church with the power of the Holy Spirit to know you, to believe on your Son, Jesus, and to be saved. And you, you laid down your life and now call us to do the same, to lay our lives down and surrender everything, to become nothing so that in each of us you will become everything. Jesus, you showed us how to live, who we should become. Pour out your Holy Spirit again in this place. Fill us to overflowing with your love and your glory and your Holy Spirit that we might bear your image and live in your likeness. And as the world waits for your return, Jesus, help us to rise up, to be alive, to be your witness to the ends of the earth and to the end of the ages until the day you return on the clouds and in glory to call us home. Until that day, our hearts burn with Holy Spirit fire. Our feet stand in the hope of the resurrection and on the rock of Jesus. And our eyes are fixed on you, our prize. Revive us, Lord. Give us life. Set us free. Holy Spirit, come.